This story, although short, will take place over a huge length of time for the colony of New Netherland. And inside of it, we'll see characters who, in our main story, are already long since dead. The settlement of Swanendijl, otherwise known as the Valley of the Swans. Although technically part of New Netherland, its history and lore is very different than that of the rest of the colony. But at this point in our podcast, it now becomes important to introduce them to the story, as it will be our omen for the entire colony. Before any European settlement in Zwanendijl, the area was inhabited by the Lene Lenape, a large, loose confederation of Algonquin tribes that varied all the way from the Delaware River and beyond, all the way up to upstate New York. The Esopus Indians, who we learned about a few episodes back, they were a very unfriendly member of this loose confederation, and their bad relations with the Dutch would lead to their extinction. This is a great example of how the Lene Lenape, in whatever sort of confederation they were in, were full of internal strife, and it would be difficult to call them any sort of collection of nation-states or a nation-state as a whole. They remain in a state of flux. In the 1620s, the Dutch established early trading posts along the Delaware River, which they called the South River. Today's Hudson River being the North River, and the Connecticut River being the Fresh River. The Dutch West India Company was hoping to have trading posts and future settlements along all three riverways in order to fully stake out their territory and the boundaries of New Netherland. In the late 1620s, the patroonship faction of the Dutch West India Company comes to power, and they're able to pass rules that allow the wealthy owners of the company to carve out what they called patroonships, sort of these English manors, or these uh, French seigneurial estates in New Netherland. This would be land where they would essentially be a noble-like figure ruling over a fiefdom that they own personally, where everyone living on the land would be their workers or would be essentially renting the land from them. A feudal-like system. In 1629, these rich investors, they send out people to buy from the Native Americans land that would soon hopefully become their patroonships. We see this on the Upper Hudson River with the uh, Rensselaerwick patroonship. And we see these in other places also, including down here on the Delaware. The Dutch always bought their land from the Native Americans as a policy. It was part of their way of proving that they had the correct ownership of the land. That being said, other powers such as the English never recognized Native American uh, land grants as they didn't believe Native Americans were the possessors of the land they lived on. The big investors in what will be Schwanendijl will be Samuel Godin and Samuel Blomert. You've heard his name before. But the patroons all agreed to give a small vested interest in each other's patroonship. This way they were all in it together. So Van Rensselaer owned a very small part also. Goijin and Blomert also accepted smaller investors who would be part of this patroonship called Schwanendijl including Captain David Peterson de Vries, who we've heard of before. His personal account of the New World, having a personal touch, a lot of the Dutch documents surviving from this period do not. So it is invaluable when you're trying to tell the story of New Netherland. Samuel Godgen at this time is the director of the Amsterdam Chamber, which of course will soon control all of New Netherland by itself without any real oversight from the Dutch West India Company above it. The director general of the colony at this point in time, 1629-1630, is Peter Minuet, a good friend of the Patroon faction. And he approves all land purchases made by these important gentlemen along the Delaware. These would be the first written deeds for land along the Delaware River, and will eventually become the legal basis for the colony and state of Delaware as a separate entity from the state surrounding it. Situated on the west side of the Delaware River, near the modern-day city of Lewis, Delaware, Schwanendijl was meant to be a whaling settlement that would both have a naval operation in the area conducting whaling operations and then also on the side be able to trade in furs. The entire operation was to be set up by this humongous ship full of colonists called the Walvis. It leaves Holland in the middle of December in 1630. It has 80 people on board, it has building materials, Bricks included, livestock, and the men on board, they weren't 
destitute colonists. They weren't religious dissidents. They weren't desperate people. They were skilled craftsmen, bricklayers, carpenters, and some farmers, along with those with experience in whaling. On their way to Zvan and Dial, some of the people are dropped off in the West Indies for other commercial pursuits. When the settlers reached the Delaware, they immediately began clearing land to create fields to grow crops. There would be no whaling activity until a small settlement was built up. For by this point in time, there had been far too many stories from the Dutch and the French and the English of colonies being set up on the quick, pursuing money, fame, fortune, or military exploits, only to find they forgot to provide food, water, and shelter for themselves. The settlers then went about building one large brick building with the bricks they had brought. And around it, they constructed a huge palisade to protect themselves. There were far too many stories about cannibalistic natives in the New World to allow for any defense weaknesses in this small little settlement. And then, as all European explorers do when they want to claim an area, they plant a coat of arms of the power to whom they owed their loyalty. In this case, there was a tin sign that they erected outside of their fortifications. And on it were the arms of Holland. A curious thing is, whenever a European group does this, the Native Americans are almost always drawn to the arms being presented, or the cross planted in the sand. For some reason, it's meant to be displayed, and every human on the planet is drawn to it. So even the Native Americans realized, this is something interesting. I should look at this. And as I mentioned before, we're inside of this large, diverse group of Lene Lenape people, who some call the Delaware people today. The settlers began to know the different tribes a little bit, and they actually got along with them for quite a while. The Native Americans were no fools, and they weren't this noble savage, which is a myth that was created some time ago. The Native Americans were well aware that Europeans brought valuable goods, goods that they could not make or manufacture themselves, and so it was always good to remain on good terms with them. And at this point in time, they were coming over in such small numbers their settlements weren't crowding out any of the Lene and Lenape people. That being said, a chief from one particular village, he found the sign beautiful, and it was made out of tin. Metal being not a thing that the Native Americans had very much of at all. Maybe some small copper ingots and spirals. Every now and then you hear an account of a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver. Again, not formed into much of anything, unless you were inside of Mesoamerica. He took down the arms of Amsterdam, and he started to make small little pipes out of the tin, which is a very malleable metal. He would brag and show off these pipes to everyone. He was very impressed with his handiwork. Of course, the Dutch, discovering their sign was missing, their arms were missing, became upset. Not terribly upset, just a little pissed off, let's say. Or perhaps just maybe more confused as to why their sign went missing. They then inquired with the chiefs that they had become friendly with as to where their sign had gone. Now, in this time, communication was fuzzy. We're talking about two people who had barely known each other, maybe a couple decades at most. And the Lene Lenape, although present in New York Harbor and having dealt with the Dutch for some time, there were many different dialects and communication was difficult. So when the Dutch went to these chiefs and explained what had happened, the chiefs came away thinking the Dutch were furious. Perhaps thinking that this was some sort of idol of the Dutch or some sort of sacred sign that had been desecrated. Of course, the sign itself was made out of metal. Again, a rare material to the Native Americans and the natural metal they found in their world, they considered a sacred item. So perhaps they thought this was a sacred totem being destroyed. Some faction loyal to those chiefs then went off and they found the chief who had made pipes out of their sign, and they killed him. The Dutch found out about this, and they were beside themselves. They were shocked. They realized, oh, um, some horrible miscommunication has happened. We weren't, we didn't want the guy dead. We just wanted to understand why he did that, or we wanted to uh, have him understand what this sign meant to us. We didn't want the poor man killed, but it was too late. And if you listen to previous episodes, on the Haudenosaunee 
and their culture, and Native American culture in general, and human culture in general, before the modern era. This would initiate a blood feud. A Hatfield and McCoy situation. You kill one of mine, I will kill one of yours. DeVries, who would later write about this incident, said that Native Americans were like the Italians, who were very vengeful. Not a politically correct thing to say today, but his point was made. With the chief's murder, this sent his allies off to plotting their revenge, and their target would be the small Dutch settlement. The friends of the slain chief observed Zvanendijl, saw the routine of the men, looked for their weaknesses, figured a way that they could get close to them. And what follows is an account from De Vries. Observing our people out of the house, each one at his work, that there was not more than one inside who was laying sick, and a large mastiff who was chained. Had he been loose, they would not have dared to approach the house. And the man who had command, standing near the house, three of the stoutest Indians, who were to do the deed, bringing a lot of bear skins with them to exchange, sought to enter the house. The man in charge went in with them to make the barter, which being done, he went to the loft where the stores lay, and in descending the stairs, one of the Indians seized an ax and cleft his head so that it fell to the ground. They also relieved the sick man of his life and shot into the dog, who was chained fast and whom they most feared, 25 arrows before they could dispatch him. They then proceeded towards the rest of the men who were at work and going amongst them with pretensions of friendship, struck them down. Thus was our young colony destroyed, causing us serious loss. De Vries himself, not in the colony at the time, but as a minor investor, he was hired to check in on the colony, only to discover in the middle of winter, their bodies frozen. He wrote of that terrible day that he found lying here and there, the skulls and bones of our people who they had killed and the heads of the horses and cows which they had brought with them. The settlement had been burned to the ground, torn apart, picked over and pillaged. There was nothing left. De Vries would later question chiefs in the area and reconstruct the story you just heard from his own quotes. De Vries and the other investors in the cold December of 1632 shut the door on Svan and Dial and abandoned it completely. This is the end of the story of the first settlement. After this point in time, the Dutch West India Company, understandably, did not take much interest in the Delaware. Of course, when Peter Minuet was fired from the Dutch West India Company, and the patroonship faction fell apart. Minuet and the big investor Samuel Blomert, they knew there was potential there. These two men would be the beginning seed of what would end up being New Sweden. And you can listen to those episodes. So during the period of New Sweden, large chunks of the Delaware River are no longer part of New Netherland. They're part of this new colony, this rogue colony, this carbon copy of New Netherland, on a much smaller level called New Sweden. And it was Minuet and it was Blomert who went turncoat and helped create that colony. But if you finish listening to those three episodes, which were previous episodes in this season of the podcast, you know that New Sweden eventually is taken over. And after 1655, Svanendijl becomes interesting again to the Dutch, as they now own it. And the Dutch are desperate to fill this colony with people loyal to them, as the English are exploding in numbers and desperately seeking other places to live, licking their chops at river valleys like the Delaware and the Hudson. And it is at this point that one man is going to take his shot at Utopia. In the ancient world, there are many tales of perfect lands. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Think of the Iroquois and their depiction of the sky people. And then even some ancient writers tried to create a fictional perfect government to rule over a city-state, such as Plato. But the word utopia itself comes from Sir Thomas More, who wrote the book Utopia in 1516. In it, he depicts his idea, or at least one of his ideas, for a new form of government and the society that it would have created that would be somewhere near perfection in his eyes. 
Of course, he set it in a faraway land, this being soon after the discovery of the New World, some unknown part. And so, like a lot of science fiction in the modern era, was able to criticize and critique the society of his day and get away with it under the guise of being about some mystical, faraway place. The word itself, utopia, is based on the Greek words, topia, meaning place, and then the U he uses in front of it could be both the Greek O-U sound or the E-U sound, meaning either the word not or good. So inside of that is a double meaning, meaning either no place or not a place or good place, as you would commonly think of as a utopia. This double meaning, which people still debate whether Thomas More meant to do this, it gave the reader the, the foreknowledge that, yes, this is a wonderful, amazing place with a radically different government and society, but also, this isn't a real place at all, I'm making this up. The double meaning. And isn't that the problem with utopias and designing your own utopia? On paper, it looks fantastic. Once you put it into play, and human beings have to live inside of it, things always start to erode. First of all, utopias are all often designed to uh, make up for the failings of previous governments, previous civilizations. And so they're very good at blocking human nature that is known, blocking failures of government in the past. But often they don't anticipate the new challenges that a brand new untested government would create. But Sir Thomas More was not alone in his pursuit of a perfect place. This era was full of people who were beginning to think about throwing off the old traditions, ideas of hierarchy. Many civilizations in Europe at this time have defined classes, not like classes in America today, where with enough effort you can climb up the class ladder or slide all the way down to the bottom of it. In this time, didn't matter how hard you worked, you were born into a certain class, and it was excruciatingly hard to move up a rank. And so these utopianists were looking for ways of living that would be different than the old way, that had been cemented into civilization for so long by this point in time. So what if you wiped the slate clean and started over from scratch with a new solid foundation? What kind of government would you make to ensure that that civilization would endure? Thomas More envisioned in his utopia, among a lot of other things, that the people would give their children baubles of gold and silver, necklaces of gems, and all sorts of the things that we value now as adults in Thomas More's real-world society of England in the 16th century. And he would instead give that to little children. And so, in that society, the trappings of wealth would become associated with children's toys. And so, the older you got, the more you would want to get rid of it, or not hoard it. And then there were men like John Calvin, who actually tried to make his own little Protestant, reformed utopia. Of course, like all utopias, failing in the process. But this did not stop his French followers, who would become known as Huguenots, Protestant Catholics, being persecuted in France, from going off into the New World and trying to start their own small settlements, little Calvinist utopias themselves. We'll learn about one next season on this podcast. And from your own memory banks, you have the Pilgrims, better known at the time as Separatists or Brownists, who were seeking out the New World to make a civilization based around God and a complete and full separation from the Church of England. That was their designed utopia. Of course, they were overwhelmed by a related group a little later on called the Puritans, who sought to make a new England. And I emphasize new because that's exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to make a city on a hill. They wanted to make a New England better than the old. That was so great the rest of the world would look upon it and learn from it. A utopia. But it wouldn't just be the Calvinist strain of Protestantism that would seek out utopias for themselves. In the Netherlands, we see the rise of the Mennonites. Now, the Mennonites were not Calvinists. And in fact, they rejected the legalism and the strictness that Calvinism had brought upon itself. Calvinism seemed to have defined all of reality already. There was no room left for growth. To the Mennonites, Calvinism seemed legalistic. It seemed static. It was already finished. One of these Mennonites would be a man by the name of Peter Plockhoy. 
Plockhoy was a man of action. And in a sort of reversal of the Pilgrims going to the Netherlands for a while, before ending up in Plymouth, in what is now Massachusetts, Plockhoy in 1658 moved to England, as that had been the site of a great revolution where a king was beheaded and the people assumed command of their country under Oliver Cromwell. He saw this as a lightning rod moment that he was going to be a part of. He wrote letters petitioning Parliament, many of them saying he wanted to create a Christian equalitarian society. He wanted to rebuild everything anew and he wanted all of England to be part of this great experiment. But Parliament ignored him and Cromwell ignored him. And unfortunately for him, Cromwell would be dead that very same year. The monarchy in the process of being restored, everything was going to go back to the way it was. And Peter Plockhoy was stuck festering in England for another three years, until 1661. When he finally made his way back to the Netherlands, he began planning his perfect utopia. The man he pulled in to help him plan this was a ex-Jesuit priest by the name of Franciscus van den Eden. Together they designed a government that would be based on preserving liberties, foster community, and be right in the eyes of the Lord. Franciscus himself, after this point, was involved in the many French wars during this time. Civil wars, in fact. Often between Huguenot groups and Catholic groups. That was tearing the nation apart. At one point, he had a plot to kill Louis XIV, the Sun King himself. He was going to have Louis XIV killed and then declare Normandy an independent republic. He was caught, of course, and then hung at the Bastille. The same building many years from now will serve as the setting for the beginning of the French Revolution. But Peter Plakoy was to get his shot at Utopia, even without his partner. The Dutch West India Company had been incurring lots of debt over this period of time. And slowly but surely, the Delaware was being bought from the Dutch West India Company by the city of Amsterdam itself. And for unclear reasons, perhaps just to get rid of the Mennonite influence in the province of Holland, Plakoy was given the chance to make his utopia in Zwanendale. It had been a generation since the last tragedy there. And it's unknown if Plakoy knew the history of the area. There doesn't seem to be any indication that he did. And our own records of that first settlement are sparse and found in the personal reflections of one man and a scant mention in the works of Adrian Vanderdonk. Did Plakoy read those documents? Maybe. Or maybe not. Maybe he had no idea what he was going into. But in 1663, his settlement is planned and ready to go. Unlike the pilgrims, who wrote up their governing document while on the boat, Plakoy carefully figured out every aspect of his society before even stepping on the boat. And his colony was going to be a commonwealth of love and equality. Reflecting his Mennonite background, Plakoy believed that not everyone in the colony needed to agree 100% on scripture or church matters or issues of the divinity of Christ even. This wasn't going to be like the rest of New Netherland where you had to officially be Dutch reform in public worship and then everybody else had to keep to themselves underground worshiping in secret. You could have lively debate and he encouraged a culture where people openly discussed issues with one another and put their ideas to the test in debate against one another. He was not a fan of official dogmas, official positions, or censorship. Believe it or not, here we are in 1663, and he has a separation of powers between the branches of his planned government. He has an executive, judicial, and legislative branch. Does that sound familiar to you? But he wasn't a modern man, and of course, only men were allowed to vote. And only if they agreed to be part of this society and they were 24 years of age or older. Laws would be passed by a supermajority of two-thirds. This way, issues that are particularly divisive or not divisive, divisive, or not clearly beneficial in one way or another could be avoided. You needed a supermajority. Any public servants in the company 
would have to be, again, 24 years of age or older. They'd have to be men. And they can't be beholden to anyone. So they can't work for anybody else. They can't have any debts. And, importantly, they can't be married. They must be unmarried. You might think to yourself, well, what? why would that matter? If you're married and you have a wife and kids, now you have all these other people in your life who you very much care about to a point where you might unfairly uh, create a situation that benefits your circle around you. If you're an unmarried man, you'll be more concerned with your own success and you won't have these attachments that might play on your natural inclination to help your own. Another point, which really doesn't apply in today's world, but very much did back then. If you had a family and you were in some position of power, perhaps you had a son, and you would see to it that your son got your job. Think about the monarchies at the time. I am the king, and my son will be the next king, and his son will be the next king. Well, that applied to a lot of other jobs below the level of the monarch in any given country. So while you're holding the seat of power, if you don't have an heir to the throne, so to speak, that issue's out of the picture also. This policy even went out to your extended family. So if you were of too close relation to another public official, that wouldn't be allowed also. Like a brother or a cousin. It's too close there's less of a chance that you will be impartial. He's, he really thought this government through. There would be one new public servant hired for every 20 new colonists. They would serve a one-year term, and they could be re-elected for one more year, and then forced retirement. A preemptive drain-the-swamp mentality. Get them in and get them out before they're easy. there's even a swamp there to be in. The executive branch should be run by an assistant and a supervising principal servant. And these should be older folks with years of experience. But they should not have political immunity. If they do something wrong or illegal, they should face the consequences. This is something many countries today still have, the idea of political immunity. Here's a guy back in 1663 saying, we're going to do away with that. Now in the foundation of the colony, the land and all of the livestock are going to be held in common. This way, everyone has a shared interest in the colony. They live together or they die together. There won't be the poor starving to death while the rich get rich and move back home. The colony will survive together or die together. When it became possible, everyone would enjoy a six-hour workday. And once the colony took off, land would be divided up for private ownership based on a lottery, Understanding that you can give everyone 100 acres, let's say, but that 100 acres isn't always equal. Some land is more fertile than other land. Some land is closer to the major waterways than other land. And so a lottery would be used instead of nepotism and uh, corrupt practices that would normally allow land in such ways. But he knew there would be inequality. And so how would the poor, who would inevitably develop as the society grew bigger, uh, be able to get along in the world? And what he devised was basically a absorption of private property back to the state if there were no heirs. If you died and you had no descendants to inherit, your property and your land would go back to the state. And then the state would utilize that land to provide for the poor in either making produce from it and using the proceeds to either feed or provide money for the poor or granting that land to the poor folks. And new people from outside of this society could work their way to, towards citizenship by relieving the work of the old folks and essentially providing for them. It's a, it's a 17th century version of social security. You have an older person who might not have very many kids or their kids have gone on to other things and neglected them. You can come in, do the farm work, provide for the older folk, and then when that gentleman dies, the property is now yours. Criminal justice is a little underwritten. I think he assumed that in this new society, the conditions being as it were, you wouldn't want to steal and kill and rape and pillage. And so there was a graduated system where if you did something wrong, at first there'd be a warning. And then secondly, there'd be a fine. And the third thing would be an expulsion or a shunning. Now, this is very similar to the Amish and the Mennonites today, who, of course, are his spiritual cousins and in the Amish community today people are shunned where I'm not going to hurt you I'm not going to kill you I'm not going to imprison you I'm going to cut you off from the vital services that our community provides 
Lastly, he wanted his government to be an independent entity, not dependent on anyone else, nor his people dependent on anybody else. And so, once everything took off, there'd be no trading with the outside world. They would be completely self-sufficient. Furthermore, here we are in 1663, a time when slavery is actually ramping up and becoming more and more popular. And he forbids slavery. He says it's a moral evil. Most of the information I'm getting about Zwanendiel comes from William, William J. Cohen. He came out with a book called Zwanendiel in New Netherland. It's a fantastic book. It's very expensive. And this is a vital source for me in this podcast, so I want to give all credit to him, but also the primary sources, Plakoy himself and so on and so forth. But William J. Cohen says that this might have been the first colony to ever explicitly ban slavery. And I think he's right. Going through my own knowledge, this is it right here. This is the origin of abolition in the New World. And in fact, it goes beyond abolition because there was never slavery there in the first place. No other colony uh, can set such a high bar. The colonists set sail in May of 1663. There were only 41 people who made the cut. Only 41 people who fit the mold of what Plakoy was looking for. Of course, in a utopia, you want to make sure there is no corrupting element. Think of the Garden of Eden. That snake. The pesky snake. Think of Atlantis and their lack of worship for Poseidon. There's always a reason for the fall. And he was making sure there wasn't anything that was going to cause an internal corruption of the beauty of his utopia. For over a year, the colony existed in silence. We have almost no record of what happened there. They didn't communicate with the rest of New Netherland. They didn't communicate with the outside world. They were busy making the most perfect place on Earth. But then in fall of 1664, the English Navy came rolling in. Led by Sir Robert Carr, they sacked the colony, scattering the 41 colonists. Peter Plakoy is never heard from again. The historical records show that around the year 1700, in the colony of Pennsylvania, there lived an old blind man by the name of Peter Plakoy. Some scholars speculate that this is Peter Plakoy himself. However, it is known that Peter Plakoy and his wife had a blind son. It very well could just be his son, and Peter perished in the sacking of his colony. The Mennonites of Plakoy's utopia might find some comfort in the Quaker experiment in the colony of Pennsylvania. There's a lot of similarities there, and they would have been quite free. But Utopia was dead. And so Zwanendiel died twice. And like all Utopias, the entire endeavor was a miserable failure. But this story started way back in 1629. Why am I telling you this now? Why is this over a dozen episodes into our series on New Netherland? Because what happened to Zwanendiel in 1664 was a small episode in what happened in all of New Netherland in 1664. The English were swarming in on New Netherland. And Peter Stuyvesant was now going to face the hardest struggle of his life. <laughs>